G'day, mate. What's your name? Uh, my name's Iman. Uh, Iman. What do you do, Iman? I am a professional smartass. Comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome back to another episode of Crowd Workcast. My name's Andrew Barnett. Thanks so much for joining me. Now, uh, before I get into the chat about my guest, I do need to do a little selfless plug right here at the top, uh, and that is for my Brisbane show that is coming up on Thursday, August 22nd at the Good Chat Comedy Club. Uh, it's going to be a really, really fun night. So if you're in or around Brisbane on August 22nd, I'd love to see you there. Tickets are only $25. You can get them at goodchatcomedy.com uh, via the link, which is in the link tree in uh, the, my bio and Instagram or via the link that'll be in the show notes for this episode. So very easy to get those. Uh, I'd love to see as many people there as possible. Now, this week's episode, uh, this was a great chat. This is with Aman Hadchidi. Now, if you've ever seen Aman perform, you will definitely remember him. Uh, he is an absolute champion. Uh, he used to hold the world record as the world's shortest stand-up comedian, uh, which he no longer holds, but uh, he is uh, incredibly funny. And um, and apart from being funny, he's one of those guys, whenever I see we're on a line-up together, I get a little bit excited because he is... Uh, well, he's just a good hang backstage. There's nothing more fun than just sitting back talking shit with a man. So uh, that's basically what we did in this episode. So you're going to enjoy it. Uh, it is a really good chat. Now, if you'd like to uh, find follow a man online, you can find out everything he's up to. The best place is on Instagram, where he is Iman Frank Hadchidi. That's I M A A N Frank F R A N K Hadchidi. H-A-T-H-A-D-C-H-I-T-I. That's Iman Frank Habitchidi. So yeah, give him a follow on Instagram. He is absolutely hilarious and go see him if you do get the chance. Other than that, if you're enjoying the podcast, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, that might be enough for now. Let's just uh, rip in. This is my chat with Iman Habitchidi. <laughs> Professional, I looked up on the internet. You do you really hold the Guinness World Record for the world's shortest stand-up comedian? I did. I oh, just did? lost it. Oh, to a comedian. Um, her name is Tanya Lee Davies. Um, she's from America. She lives in Las Vegas, yep. and uh, she's been doing it longer than me. But she got older and shrunk a bit. So, she, <laughs> so now she has it, and that's fine with me. I think coming second is nicer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so how like. How tall are you? Like, uh, not very. Not very. <laughs> no, uh, three foot four on a good day. Three foot four on a good day. <laughs> yeah. The, if the I, hair's volumized. Yeah, if I've stretched, you know. That's, that's fantastic. So how long have you been doing stand-up? Um, it's close to 20 years now. Holy shit. Yeah. It'll, March March of next year will be 20 years. Wow. Yeah. So did you grow up in South Australia? Is I was born you, there. You were born there. But then I uh, grew up in Melbourne because my parents divorced when I was three. And okay. Mum went to live with my auntie. In Melbourne? In Melbourne, yeah. And then Catholic school upbringing all the way through. Oh, nice. The only non-baptised Catholic at the Catholic <laughs> school, which was fun. Yeah. Yeah, and then I did comedy when I was 15. Oh, wow, so you started early. Yeah, I was, did. Was that like Class Clowns or? That's the one. Wow, that's, um, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's a good way to get into it. I, I, there's a few, I wonder how what the conversion rate for people who get into class clowns yeah. that actually go through with it. Because there's there's a few, I think Aaron Chen did class Aaron clowns. Aaron Chen, Tom Ballard. Yep. I mean, in my class, it was Tom Ballard and uh, Jordan Shanks, I just realised. Oh, really? Was in my class. I didn't realise. Wow. Yeah. And there's a burlesque uh, dancer. Her name is Kale Murray. And she's <laughs> very funny. Uh, so she was, I'm guessing she wasn't burlesquing at No, not at back school. then. She was doing sketch comedy. Oh, no. Nice. And I just did a gig with her. A few nights ago, and she does this burlesque act as a sloth. As a sloth? Yeah, and she just, sloth with like little pasties, but, and then the sloth moves up, moves the arm, moves it back down, and she goes back to sleep. That's the whole act. It was <laughs> fucking weird. I loved it. <laughs> Where was that? Uh, that was at uh, 280 Cabaret. It's like a, on um, Cleveland Road. They're just, uh, it's like a little cabaret theatre bar. So you do a bit of cabaret yeah. performing as well? Yeah, I'm allowed to. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I'm allowed to. Yeah, yeah, I can do both. Like I do burlesque and cabaret comedy and yep. comedy comedy. Oh, no. So when, you, when you're when you doing the burlesque and cabaret comedy, 
is it different to your act? It's just quicker, sharper. You know, it's like less hands in pocket. Yep. Uh, and you've got to wear a suit. That's the only difference. And I just do dirtier material. Okay. So okay. like, you know, jokes about women's asses and whatnot. I was going to say, because you don't, um, like we worked together last weekend and like, you, not that you're filthy, but you're not exactly super clean either. Like no. It's not... <laughs> no, no, I, I speak like I speak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is probably why you probably never see me on TV. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, we've seen your movies, though. Yeah. That's the other thing I looked up. is Because you, you're one of the comedians I know who comes up. I don't know if you know this when you Google it. You'll come up with that. You know the little profile that's at the top of Google? Oh. And it's Iman Hadchidi, actor. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. You are listed as an actor, my friend. Fuck yeah. Made yeah. us. Yeah. So that's... um because So let's start with comedy. So what yeah. was it about comedy that... Like, well, I already I was already getting stares, you know. Mm -hmm. People were already making fun of me as a kid, and I just wanted to have the power. Yep. So I just that's why it's comedy because I was like, um, people are gonna stare at me anyway. Let me tell them why they're staring. Yeah. So was that like? Was that was that a lot like through school? Was there a lot of that sort of shit, or was it? Just... Well, yeah, I mean, it was just. I mean, it's well-meaning, but always othered, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, it's because, like, my mum was overly protective. She wouldn't let the school let me play with everyone. Oh, no. So I had a designated area in the, in the, in the yard, in the schoolyard, and oh, then I'd have... I was that sounds allowed... alarmingly like a pen. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was one little hill, and I was allowed one friend on this hill. Oh, really? It was brutal. And who wanted to be that guy? No one wanted to be the friend with the only one. Well, it's also a lot of pressure for kids too, because you, 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 growing up, you're hanging groups. Yeah. Because the the one on one social pressure it's, it then isn't as much. It was very very awkward. So I'd Holy I'd, shit. I'd invite one of my friends, and we'd play you know whatever, pretend cricket or whatever. Yeah. And then I'd hit the ball, and he'd go, he'd have to go and get it, and then he'd bump into someone else he liked, and he'd never come back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, so wow. So it was like. You know, it's not like necessarily bully bully, but like it just circumstances made my, I don't know, me a bit different. Yeah. Like, you know. Made it, made, yeah, like, yeah, it's incidental sort of. Yeah. Ending up with, yeah, being socially isolated sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, and then. Do you have brothers and sisters or anything? Or yeah, I have a si older sister. Older sister? Yeah, she's eight years, seven and a half years older. Oh, wow. Uh, she's also short. It's actually, oh, really? It's named after her. Really? Yeah, we're the only ones in the world with this kind of. Midgetitis, I think I'm going to call it. Midgetitis. What is the official name of it? It's called the Rima syndrome. The Rima. So you, her name is syndrome. But um, just sorry, I had to get it out there. <laughs> so, but her name's Rima. Yeah. So not only like, and just it's basically just you, you two. Yes. So not only do you have one of the rarest yeah conditions on the planet, but, but also you don't get it named after you. That's, yeah, which I'm happy, I'm totally fine with. Yeah? That's, that's all right. Yeah, I don't She want got to, naming rights because yeah, she was first. Yeah, it's fine. She, she, she went through all the hard shit to mm -hmm. get that naming right, you know, like the yeah. tests and, because my, my oh, parents yeah. thought she was malnutritioned. Oh, really? Because she was like, she was born a normal baby, she just wasn't rowing. And oh. so they thought that she was somehow dying of something. So they traveled the world, tested her, and like she was pretty much like a pincushion. People were just putting things in her. Wow. And then one doctor was like, look at her. She's happy. She's eating. She's pooping. She's got good skin and the color. Uh, she's fine. There's nothing wrong with your daughter. And then they took an Australian doctor to tell us that. Wow. But my parents traveled the world oh from one God. charlatan to another. Yeah. The one, oh, man. That's, yeah. That would have been a cost of fortune too, I'd imagine. Yes. And Especially, my, what, what are we talking, the 80s? Yeah, eighties. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, air travel wasn't. Yeah, and my dad actually moon because my dad's a muso. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, he was moonlighting. He was playing street shows to pay for the travel. Oh wow! In in like south of France, he was just like busking. Oh wow! And he ended up busking with the Gypsy Kings. Oh really? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, the little little weird shit like that. No. Nice. Because my dad was in the um, first and only uh, Lebanese Beatles cover band. <laughs> First and only. <laughs> That's fantastic. So did they sing in English or sing in Arabic? Oh, no, no, definitely in English. In English. Yeah, they sang all the Beatles songs. Yeah. And Bee Gees and they had the afro and the, <laughs> and the flares. It was really cute. That's it. That's 
it's surprisingly a um, large sort of a larger market than you'd think. Like there's people that just live their life yeah. doing those covers. I actually live near, um, and I've been trying to work out how to, like do a bit about it because it fascinates me. A guy who is an Elvis impersonator. Yeah. Like I see him at the shops all the time, and that's a full time gig. In that, like, yeah. even when you're not. Yeah, you're always gig, on. You look like Elvis. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you can't take the jumpsuit off and suddenly lose weight. <laughs> yeah, no, and you like the hair is always it's like you got to have your hair. The Did he have the same? Yep. So yeah, He's got the the full look. How come all the Elvis impersonators go for the time when Elvis was the least happy to emulate? Ooh. You know, that's a deep question because, like, Elvis was a handsome man with like he didn't have that. No, he didn't have the sideburns the whole time. Yeah, I suppose though, when because this guy'd be older than Elvis was when Elvis passed away, but, um, <laughs> but it's probably harder to maintain that real thin, good looking young Elvis look yeah. than it is to go, you know what, he let himself go towards the end. I'll, I'll be that guy. Yeah, I, uh, I, I once worked with this, um. Uh, Michael Jackson impersonator. Oh, yeah. Uh, before everything was like, you know, before all the shit was happening with Michael yeah, Jackson. Yeah. And this person dedicated so much, they actually got plastic surgery to look like Michael Jackson. Oh, my God. And then he gets cancelled post-mortem. Oh. I mean, how shit would you feel? That is. <laughs> it's also the, um, it's like, uh, uh, the thing that fascinates me about it is I get people that want to be rich and famous. But the rich bit seems to be the best, from my point of view, yeah. the rich bit's the good part of that deal. Yeah, yeah. Like fame's the downside exactly. of, getting, of getting rich doing entertainment stuff. But like an Elvis impersonator, a Michael Jackson impersonator has chosen to be famous. And not rich. But never, they have the prospect of ever being rich. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, <clears throat> some of them, they do pretty well. You'd be surprised. Yeah, but not. It's like, not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, not. Yeah. They've Michael got, Jackson level. No, no, no. Not, they're not going to be like uh, millionaires or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Baba. Mm -hmm. Baba are killing it. They're everywhere. They're always touring. Yeah, well, uh, they, but also I feel like that's an easier look to blend in off stage. Yeah, pr like, yeah you, probably. You go Michael Jackson or Elvis, That's those are distinct yeah. looks. Are we going to get Taylor Swift impersonators in 40 years' time? Oh, 100% we are. <laughs> I, I'd be surprised if there's not Taylor Swift impersonators kicking around now. <laughs> That's, um, oh, man. Yeah, no, it's, uh, so. I, I think I'd go for someone less talented, though. Like, what, Taylor Swift. Yeah, like, realistically, if you're going for Elvis, Michael Jackson, or Taylor Swift, that's, that's a level of, t like, it's yeah. very quick to go, man, eh, not quite. You know, you haven't quite hit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not quite Tato. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why Abba is probably easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're singing a part. Yeah. You got people with you. Yeah, my dad was the Ringo in Beatles, so that was easier. Oh, nice. So <laughs> was he? Was your dad like a drummer or did he play lots of different things? He played everything. Yeah. Um, except for the bass. That was my uncle. Oh, okay. And my uncle was... Uh, he was the poor? Yeah, definitely my uncle was... He was, all, he was the poor, but he was... Uh, he drank quite a bit as well. Oh, okay. Bless him. Bless <laughs> him. So both parents... Um, Lebanese. Lebanese, born and raised in Lebanon? Yeah. Yeah, when uh, did when did the move to Australia happen? My dad moved in the early seventies, I think, because um, oh, it's a weird, very. So my great grandfather uh, was in the last government of Lebanon before the civil war. Oh wow! Right, he was the foreign minister or something, something, and he saw the writing on the wall. He yep. saw he was like, "Our party just won. I don't trust my party with the full power." So he told my dad to take all the money and the kids and move to Australia because Lebanon's about to fail. Wow. And then years and years later, my dad went back to Lebanon, met my mum and brought her over. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so there's like a little stories there. That's a crazy story. Yeah, I've, and even like, my, there's weird family history. Like I have, we have a Titanic survivor in our family. What? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought my dad was just shitting me and then I found the name in the records. Wow. Yeah, so all this stuff, like, yeah, our family's been everywhere. Lebanese people are, they're like a herpes. They're everywhere. <laughs> well, I think, I think I read a thing about Lebanon. Lebanon and Ireland are similar in that they've both got more citizens living globally than yes. in the country itself. Yes. There's more citizen, Lebanese citizens in Brazil. Oh, wow. Than in Lebanon. That's yeah, amazing. By heaps. Like it's, yeah, there's like 37 million outside of Lebanon and 9 million in Lebanon. Wow. So uh, 
those living outside, are they still allowed to vote and stuff? Uh, yes. They're, not only that, they're allowed to run. Run for election? Yeah, because we have six seats. So each you know province has their seats. Mm. And then there's the expat seats. And there's six expat seats. And you can be an expat running. And only expats are allowed to vote for the expat seats. And then you have to move to Lebanon for those years. Wow. Yeah. So Fatty Kassab could be a... Oh, absolutely. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Let's, we'll get on that. Yeah, get yeah. I, I would, I'd be running, mate. That would be amazing. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So you, like, so you were born in South Australia. How old were you when you guys moved to Three. Melbourne? Three. Okay. So you, no, yeah. you didn't get too much South Australia. Right? No, no, no. I, I still say yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> So growing up in Melbourne, so 15, you start comedy. Yeah. Um, was it always stand-up was what you were drawn to or was it scared? Like, you, always you... stand-up. It was Bill Hicks. Yeah, really? Bill Hicks was like my, the beacon that I was following, you know. I'm just like every other white comic, guys. <laughs> How did you find Bill? Like, because what, what years are we talking? 2005. 2005, okay. So you're, you're quite a bit younger than I'm, yeah. I am. But so my... 2005, even then, like, the internet was like, no, someone gave my um, brother-in-law gave me a CD. Right. He saw because I, I was into uh, Eminem. Yep. And my brother-in-law was like, "Oh, you got a little bit of a dirty mind. Here, have, have, have some Bill Hicks." And Fantastic. I got obsessed. Yeah. I could do it word for word. I still could. What What age are we talking then? Fifteen. Fifteen. So yeah, it was like fourteen, fifteen, and then. <laughs> How did the Bill Hicks style comedy go in class clowns? Oh, not very well. <laughs> I almost lost because I said the word asshole. Really? Yeah. That was the story. Apparently, I wasn't allowed to swear. Um, but I was saying it through all the heats and then came to the final. And I was saying the same joke every time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, apparently, Adam Richards was one of the judges. He told me. He's like, one of the other judges was like, he was, shouldn't be allowed to win because he swore. And then Adam was like, well, he was the funniest one. If you wasn't allowed to win, why did you let him in the fucking competition? Yeah. So it was a weird thing. And then I did raw. I didn't even pass the heat. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, is, that makes perfect sense for comedy. Yeah, That's it does. exactly. I love comedy competitions. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> if, there's, if there's one thing that should be competitive, it's creativity. It's yeah, exactly. I'd love to see, you know, Da Vinci against Michelangelo, you know, like a painting off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's... But wait, when did you start? Man, I started... My first gig was like end of 2009, but then I sort of, I did Raw 2010. Okay. And I knew it from then and yeah, just. Uh, yeah, so we're pretty much, because I did start in 2005, but you know, mm. I was a teenager, so yeah. I wasn't really gigging every night. And all well, that. you're not able to get out as much and yeah. you, know, you don't have your own um, agency in terms yeah. of ability to go. And you can't even get into half the places. Well, um, I had a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> That's those good Lebanese jeans. Oh, thank God for that. I remember <laughs> going to the comics lounge almost every week um, and drinking with the boys with the mustache. And then I invited them to my 18th. <laughs> and Dan O'Sullivan was like, you what? <laughs> well, it'd be, I'd, there'd be some social, like, Social awkwardness too with like a yeah. small person who's got a mustache. Like to be even ID'd. if you look like you've got a young face, then like yeah. am I insulting to um? Oh, I got carving? away with, I got away with so much. I would go to the bottle shop for my mates. Really? And they'd be like, "Can you get a bottle of vodka?" And da, da, da. I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And I'd go, <laughs> and I'd be like, "Can I get all this?" And he goes, oh, "I need to see some ID." I'm like, "Oh, so I'm in my shorts. They're not with me." He goes, "No, I, need, I can't sell it to you unless I see ID." I'm like, "This is fucking bullshit." Bada bada bada. I don't need your, uh, I don't want to give you my business. And I'd go next door to another bottle shop, angry, going, <laughs> can you believe the cunt next door didn't let me buy the vodka? He goes, yeah, some people these days. And he's packing my bag. <laughs> and he goes, do you want me to put it into your car? I go, no, no, don't worry. My kids will help me. My and I, wh and I whistled me. and then six or seven 15 year olds come running in, grab and, and dash. And at that moment he realized he fucked up. That is... That's amazing. <laughs> that's so good. Just playing, yeah. Yeah, you got to play the card. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, because I mean, like, I got such hairy legs. Like, I oh, need yeah. the drink. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you um, so grow like going through school and that. Did you did you just go basically straight from school into full time stand up, or did yeah. you 
you didn't bother, like, no study or anything like that? No, no, no. I, I had a gap year. Yeah. Because I told my mum it was a gap year. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do comedy and I'm going to work uh, for the Comics Lounge yep. as a door-to-door salesman. As a door-to-door salesman? Yeah, they used to do those uh, comedy tickets. Really? So you'd knock on businesses and go, hey guys, would you like uh, eight tickets for 50 bucks? You can see Carbone, you can see... They're, they're never there. But <laughs> <laughs> All people that have played there at some stage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Would you like to see uh, George Capinaris for the 17th time? <laughs> <laughs> And then, so I would just get paid cash with that. And then instead of going to school the next year, to any uni, I just saved up all my money and said, mum, I'm moving to London. Oh, wow. And I just fucked off. So you went, so basically what, at this point, you're like a couple of years into comedy. Yeah. In London, how, like. I was like 20 when I moved to London, 2021. 20, how did, how did the London experience go? Ah, uh, I loved it. Yeah? I had a ball. Yeah, just doing the dirty open mics, you know, bitching about, you know, oh, can you believe that guy got live at the Apollo? You know, yeah, all that stuff. All the comedian stuff. Yeah. Um, I worked uh, as a, at a day job as a cook uh, and caterer, which was fun. And cool. yeah, just had a really cool life. As a cook and caterer? Like what sort of stuff are you? Like obviously you haven't yeah. trained. What sort no, it was of like Lebanese, like tabbouleh and like, and then eggs and I'd make um, uh, chicken soup and. And I'd make cakes and stuff. Easy stuff. Easy stuff. And I got paid uh, 30 bucks, 30 pounds an hour. Jeez, that's not bad. Yeah. Very, I was very lucky. And I got to do gigs in the cafe and it was just at the end of my street. Oh, that is a life. Yeah. I Especially had... when you're like early 20s, yeah. no responsibilities. Like... Yeah. And just like my boss would tell me off for mopping. He goes, you're an artist. You shouldn't be mopping. Roll us a joint. And then he'd <laughs> mop. You know, it was just, it was a really sweet life. <laughs> that is a good life. That's... Uh, yeah, when, when what kind of I don't know what kind of boss is paying you thirty pounds an hour is like no you're too you're too artistic to mop. yeah exactly he just basically he paid me to have a charming like likable talker yeah uh, in the in the cafe when he wasn't around so like you would keep because he wanted a community vibe yeah so he just wanted someone that had a gift of the gab to talk to strangers yeah perfect yeah perfect job for you oh it was really good especially when you're doing like gigs at night and that yeah, sort of stuff. Like exactly. That's, yeah, that's the exactly low co- kind of low uh, low maintenance day job. Exactly. And he was like, it's a co- cafe. And he realised that it was doing night shifts, uh, doing comedy. So he'd be like, you start work whenever you walk in the door. Like there was no, <laughs> like. <laughs> hey, well, you, mate, you were kissed on the dick by a fairy with yeah, this job. That's, that's amazing. That's a patronage, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, got a patron who's just like, yeah, yeah I'll yeah. support his art dreams. That's yeah, it was, it was very cool. So uh, how long were you in London? Uh, two and a half years. Yep. Uh, then my visa ran out. Yeah, that'll uh, happen. That, yep. And then I moved back to Sydney for love and then didn't work out. Never moved for love. And then I moved to Berlin uh, for four years and started d- b- darting back and forth. What were you, so Berlin, like what were you doing there? Stand up and. Stand up and whatever. too many drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not recommend Berlin to, to grow a career. Oh, really? Oh, it's horrible. Especially if you're an English speaking stand up. Yeah, because there's definitely a glass ceiling. Yeah. 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 English, English comedy in Germany was like every expat made the same joke. Yeah. You know, I've really picked a niche market. Comedy in Germany is niche enough. And then English on top of that, you know. So is that like, is the scene there you're mostly playing to expats or are you playing like a little, because I mean, there's a fairly good English literacy. Yeah, yeah. It's, you're playing mostly to, uh, yeah, like lots of Slovenians and Lithuanians and Swedish people that like English. Mm. And then they have like an American friend. So it was like, it was very mixed bag uh, rooms and you had to really slow your jokes down and, you know, but you could be filthy. Because there was no, there was no dream of getting on the project. There is no project, yeah. you know. So like, no one was watching what they were saying. It's um, it's funny that sometimes that those gigs where it, there's no greater agenda, like there's no where to go. That's where it's almost a bit, not not purer, but like that. There is that. Yeah, it's more flow statey, mm. so to speak. I loved it. There was this open mic night on a Sunday. It would start at eight thirty, and it would finish. At 3 a.m. 
Jesus, that sounds like a nightmare. And uh, and the lady running it, it wasn't just comedy, it was poetry. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, no, no, you're not making it any better for yeah, me. Yeah, wait, but the lady, she, she hated, like all the comedians would do their gigs and then come and demand to be put on. Yeah. And then she would push them all the way back to 2 a.m. Oh. And the bar loved it because by 2 a.m. we're all fucking pissed. And the, the show is, is loose as hell. It's, so what, what sort of a crowd are you playing to at 2 a.m.? Is, is there anyone left? You're, you're playing to like 5 to 15, like guys with their head down. <laughs> and then yeah. they, I, you get this one, you go, ha! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just really primed to laugh. At yeah, exactly. Time. So you really, it was good to try out material. Oh, wow. So what brought you back from Germany? Uh, I just, I was quite depressed there. I wasn't living a good life. I lost a lot of weight and I just wanted to shake it up. And so I moved back to Australia for a little bit. And I was, but I kept doing the six months, six months. Mm. So, you know, festival chasing. Yep. And then, so you do Edinburgh and that sort of stuff? Yeah, but... every year. I've done Edinburgh six times. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, which is amazing. Like uh, <laughs> when you like hang out with comedians in Australia, there's definitely like a, a cast system. A you cast know? system, all right. You know, I, like, I like to hear this theory. Like, you know, like your open micers mm. are not having a beer with Dave Hughes. No. Like that's not happening. Well, not that he's not. No, not, not that he's not. A, they just wouldn't necessarily bump cross paths yeah or like you know you will all those like tv guys mm. and then suddenly you're all in edinburgh and then suddenly you know i've never spoken to sam simmons but then sam simmons like let's have a beer because they're alone again yes <laughs> and then suddenly you become australian <laughs> mates so and then you <laughs> you know it's it was an interesting that yeah that, i suppose that would I, having never done edinburgh i'd imagine that that would be very um like once you like, oh, here's a familiar face. Yeah, suddenly you you were you're both overseas out of your element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've made a lot of good comedian friends touring that I probably wouldn't have been friends with if we both stayed in Australia. You know, mm. um, which is kind of bizarre. Yeah, yeah. like uh, yeah, your Roe Campbell's. You know, Roe Campbell's been everywhere. Do you know Roe? Yeah, like everywhere. And so there's your brain tricks you. And it goes, I've seen this person in three different countries. He must be a mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is too. Like, I, I, I don't know. There is something I find that I, like, you bond quick with comedians. When you've been on a show with people and yeah. that sort of stuff, there, there is just that, I don't know, like, it, I suppose you get it in an office job as well. We worked here together or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, the comedians, it's very quick, I find, to be like. To bond. Yeah. I think with an office job, it's a bit more like school. Like okay. you don't have a choice. Yeah. Whereas you can actually pick which comedians you bond with, you know? Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. It's always funny though. Like, cause like, I don't know about you, but I find like there's people I work with, like you don't see them. Like you, for example, I didn't, I didn't work with you for like, I saw you then I maybe yeah. a couple of years we don't see each other. Exactly. And then all of a sudden we're on a run of gigs together for six months and then, you know, yeah. you don't see each other for ages. It's just but you know what I like about comedy is it's very much just pick up where you left where off. Where you left off. Exactly. And no one's hurt. No. Why didn't you call me you yeah, know, yeah. There's none of that. It's just what what have you been up to? Yeah. Oh, you've been doing this. Yeah, oh, I did this gig like and especially if you've each had a shitty gig that you get to talk about. Oh yeah. It's Yeah, but we've never had a shitty gig together. No, Ooh, no. Maybe early on, but I don't think no, so. No, I don't think we've ever had a shitty gig together. Yeah. We had a wild gig the other night on Friday night. Yeah. Did you? Yes. Were you there at the end? No, I left. Oh, there was um, there was sick on the floor. <laughs> I'm not going to mention the venue because I don't want. I love that venue, but yeah, yes. yeah. And it was the most bizarre place. That yeah, like right near the door, like walking. So I think they've gone to walk out and was it was it the that heckler the one that stood up. I don't know. I, Do you remember her? Yes. That was hilarious. Crazy. That was a dr the drunkest audience. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's that lady. I think she was from the original South Wales, I think was her heckle. <laughs> yeah. uh, that lady is like about 60% of UK audiences. Oh, wow. They're Just all like that. Blitzed. Blitzed and mouthy and you got to tame them. Yeah. And that's why I loved gigging in the UK because... Uh, you know, you got to work for it. Like comedian, uh, the audiences here are too nice. Yeah, I don't, 
<laughs> I don't know about too nice, but yeah, they, I think I like a bit of. I'm gonna be honest. I like a bit of tete a tete, but I think there's um, there's an etiquette to it. Like you got to have the audience that knows when. Okay, the exchange. Like they exactly. want the exchange, but they know when to go. Okay, the exchange is over. Yeah, yeah. Now let's just. Yeah, she. Eh. Yeah. She was having a good time. I see. I'd prefer the interaction more than the people who just now, like you see people now that'll get their phone out, oh. or they'll film you, or they. Like, I don't get it. Anyway, if you're not gonna. Like people, <laughs> people out there, if you're going to take your phone out to film, you're not watching it in the room. What makes you think you're going to watch it later? Like, it's just the weirdest thing. A hundred percent. Like I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think they're waiting for one of us to snap so they can post it and yeah. like, you know, oh yeah, uh, comedian says this crazy thing, but oh, like, it's just. That's the, um, the Hofstetter thing. Remember that? What's his name? James. Steve. Steve Hofstetter. Steve Hofstetter. Man, he just. He rode, he was the first heckler video and he rode that wave. Mm. Jesus Christ. But I, I, I don't know, like I, I, I don't, I like doing crowd work and I've always, enjoyed, hence why this is called, this podcast was called Crowd Work Cast because okay. I always enjoyed doing crowd work. Yeah. But lately, since it's become a big trend, I'm, I'm a bit, I enjoy it less in clubs than I used to, I think, because there is that sometimes there's the expectation of like, yeah, and it's like yeah, and you can't do. And it used to be able to be like the MC does crowd work, mm. and then the comedians get to do their jokes. Yes, but now if the MC does too much crowd work, you, you you've opened the door. But it's not even just the MC does crowd work. Sometimes like you go to a night and like the first, like you get to the fourth act, the MC's done a bit of crowd work. The fourth act is asking the same group of people, "What do you do?" Like Which, it's like, okay, like yeah, because and I get it. Like people are looking for their clips and that sort of stuff, but, but you. Ask more interesting questions. Or just do some jokes. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> we, we all get worried about burning material online. It, like, have a look at how many views any of your clips have got. Nah. You haven't burned. I'm not, it, yeah, yeah. It's I'm a not, big global audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not worried about burning. Yeah, no, and it's, yeah. But I think that we are in a weird space with that crowd work stuff. But, yeah, we, we like you said, we really... Haven't had yeah. I'm trying to think of bad gigs we've ever had together. We no. haven't. We've had some crackers. That yeah. one we did at um, Thoreau. Oh, that was gorgeous. Was magnificent, magnificent. So it was at Anita's Theatre. Magnificent. One of the most beautiful theatres I've ever been to. Yeah, and when you there was at the start when you were zipping around. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've heard a crowd as like what is going on. <laughs> That's the stupidest line I've ever come up with. <laughs> Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, and it was such a beautiful theatre. And the meal next door was gorgeous. Oh, yeah. That's see, that's where, like, you look at, like, for all the stuff, you know, you, you we all whinge about in comedy or whatever. Yeah. You, you have a day like that and you go, you know what? It's pretty good. That's a good day at work. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I'm very lucky. I haven't had to get a job. Yeah. I've, I've been able to just, just do stand-up. And so I, I complain a little bit, but fuck me, man. But I'm we all lucky. do. Yeah. Yeah. Why like, not? But uh, so the acting stuff, how did all that come about? Because you were in like your first, your big credit, on, big credit on the internet is Thor Love and Thunder. Yeah. Three seconds. <laughs> hey. Well, I'll it's, take it. It's more, more than I was in yeah. Thor Love and Thunder. And during COVID. So the late, the, well, funnily enough, I got the job because of an open mic I did in Sydney. Really? Years and years before. Uh, the World Bar. You know, oh, remember? yeah, I remember the World Bar at King's Cross. So this um, uh, costume designer, she did it for Apocalypse Now, the Mel oh, Gibson wow. one, and she had this idea to make a, a Native American god, a small one. And so she wanted me. So she told the casting director to find me. Wow. And so that's how I got that job. It, it, that's fun. one of those things where you're saying find this person, but... In terms of Google searches. Yeah, I'm very findable. <laughs> Without knowing your name, you're you're more findable than Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and they wanted, um, yeah, they wanted us different ideas of gods and then they she she made the costume, they did the whole thing. The director said, I'm not sure if we, we need this character. And she's like, bitch, I worked so hard on this costume, we're having this character. <laughs> so I was, they, they pushed me in. I, it was just me and the green screen. Very boring. Oh, really? So yeah. you weren't in the room with anyone else? No. Oh, another god. 
uh, the Jade God. He was, uh, I mean, <laughs> he was a Chinese actor pretending to be Japanese, and it was <laughs> really <laughs> because they'd like it was just reactions. Yeah. So we're sitting there. There's a green screen. They have a a volleyball with Russell Crowe's face on it. And it's like the volleyball's over there. So move your eyes now. Laugh now. Go groan, and then he's they you know now Iman laugh and I laugh, and then you know Jade uh, Asian guy laugh and he goes whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's laying on the Japanese. He's laugh. laying on the Japanese laugh, and the director's like, "Can you tone it down, it a, down a bit?" <laughs> it was so, <laughs> it was very funny. The poor guy. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And then um yeah, so that was during COVID. It was a blessing. Yeah. Absolute blessing because I had no money. Wow. So did you get to go to like go to a premiere or anything? Or no, no, you... no. During COVID. Oh, of course. Nothing was out. Um. I was filmed, it was filmed here in Sydney mm. um, and it was wild because it was during the early stages of the COVID test where you couldn't leave the house once you've taken the test yep. until you got your results. And because of that, they paid me per test, 500 bucks. Really? So about 40% of my fee was, <laughs> was sticking things up my nose. I suddenly became a sideshow act. <laughs> oh, wow. So well, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, and so I was literally there for three seconds. Blink and you'll miss me. Uh, I laugh at a dick joke, which is really in character. <laughs> yeah, you feel like you're being typecast as the guy uh, who laughs at dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I've been, I have been typecast. Every gig I've ever had, actor, except for one, I've had a hat on. Really? I've had something on my head, except for the last, the recent one. So how many roles have you done now? What do we... We've done uh, Wilfred. Yep. I was the possum. Uh, Love and Thunder, and I was uh, in a montage for, uh, uh, what's it called? Late Night with the Devil. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I was cut from a movie where I pretended to be a Dolly Parton impersonator. <laughs> in a week. What, what movie is that? That's an Australian movie called Seriously Red. That's... Um, the idea that you would choose to be a Dolly Parton impersonator is outstanding. Yeah, no, I just rocked up. There was the theatre that they were using to film this scene. Mm. I was doing a gig the next night, so I was hanging out there at Brunswick Heads, and they were like, "What are you doing now?" I'm like, "Nothing." Like, "All right, we've got a, we got some fake tits, and da, da, da. let's make you Dolly Parton." So I did it. It was really funny. <laughs> That's fantastic. I shared a scene with Danny Minogue, and she also got cut. Oh, really? <laughs> So do you think it was her it acting that got you both cast? It cut? must have been. Danny. Danny. Come on. And, um, and then now recently, uh, Time Bandits is coming out every episode and I play a detective. Oh, really? A time traveling detective. So is that like a recurring role in yeah. that one? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's, it's exciting. I yeah. Hopefully, please go out, watch it on Apple Plus because season two, they've said my role would get bigger. Really? Yeah. So Time Bandits, what's that? Is that like... It's a remake of a Monty Python film. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, no. you never, it's about... Um, no, I've never seen it. It's about this kid who finds this map uh, and you can like travel in between time and... Like the map is time and place. So, and there were these bandits that would travel, uh, let's say, to the Renaissance era and steal a painting and bring it to the future and sell it. Ah... And so I'm trying to catch those guys. Oh, that's a great, what a, yeah, well, Monty Python, obviously, yeah. it's a great concept. But yeah. that's, um, oh, so Apple TV Plus, I'm going to watch it. And yeah. that's, that's suitable to watch with kids? Yes, yes. Gold, all right. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, like, it's good for like 13 to 15, like, like kids, like nine. Like, te like not babies. Yeah, yeah, like tween to teen. Yeah, exactly, because yeah, yeah. there's some, you know, historical facts and uh, Lisa Kudrow's in it and she's kooky and weird. And fun. So did you get to actually act with those no. people? No. <laughs> I got Do you ever get to act with anyone or are you I, just no, the, the volleyball I, guy? They only get me to act with uh, the dog from Wilfred and uh, fellow midgets. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something got to do with the angles. I don't know. But if Tom Cruise could do it. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Just, mate, good set of lifts. Yeah. You just need to do your own stunts. I, which I have done. Really? Yeah, I mean, they're getting tackled in Wilfred. <laughs> they tried to get a kid in my shape to get tackled. Uh, How is that safer than you getting tackled, an adult? I don't. I just, like, 
to get and, getting replaced by a stunt kid. I know, right? That's, that's, they that's realized, actually insulting. They realised that way later. And then <laughs> I got paid twice as a stuntman and as an actor. How good. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the dream. Yeah. Two and that, paychecks. Oh, fantastic. And then I got a speeding ticket on the way. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how you stunt guys drive. Yeah, we just... just Transferred all about the speed. <laughs> I'd love to be a stunt driver. That would be my dream. Yeah? Yeah. I love driving. It's my favorite thing. So, do, you, do you, like, with, sorry to yeah, be no, asking. Yeah, no, no, I say that question. just. Yes. Obviously, <laughs> like, how, how much modification do you have? Uh, with the NDIS, what you do is you get a little bitch boy at the bottom, and then they, <laughs> and then they hit the pedals for you for 45 bucks an hour. No. <laughs> no, they just extend the pedals. Oh, cool. So it's just like um, like a clamp on like top, a, yeah. And then you can take them in and out. And then I've got a like a booster seat you put on top, made yeah, out nice. of leather, and it's nice. Yeah, super Sweet. easy. Are you I'm into not, cars or just just the practicality drive? of them? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I am into. I'm not allowed to drive manual by law. Oh really? Because it's one too many pedals. Yeah, the clutches. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I do love a like a a good utility vehicle, like. Do you ever, do you ever though, just slip like a, like a, the old, um, like the automatic transmission into that sport mode and just oh, shift through the gears? I haven't got one of those fun. cars yet. Oh. I've, I've got a really, um, kind of old SUV. They don't, I'll tell you, they don't change the way you think they're going to change. It's <laughs> those paddle shit. Like, yeah, just yeah. Like, oh, this is, it actually feels a bit like, <laughs> wrong. Oh, and no, it's like playing Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. When you play on hard level and you have to change gears. So you drive an SUV? Yeah, too. yeah, because I tow in my caravan. I've got a. Did I tell you about the caravan? Thing no, yet? you haven't told me about the caravan. So I, I'm an idiot. So during just before COVID, I um I had this idea to build a little theatre that seats twenty people on a trailer, and then tow it around festivals. And don't worry about getting a venue. BYO venue. Bring your own venue. And so I, I haven't. I still almost done. Uh, I've done a few. I've done about a hundred shows in there. Wow. Um, but I'm going to make it raked seating. And it's just, it's about 800 kilos. Yep. And I can tow it. That's fantastic. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, it's really silly. That's genius. Thing. Well, yeah, but it also, like, your style of comedy, apart from, like, like the, the initial pop that gets when yeah. people see you on stage, they're like, this isn't what we were expecting. Yeah. But your style of comedy is very loose. Like, it leans into that sort exactly. of. Exactly. Well, that's where I trained. Mm. My first real, real paid work was um, freak shows. Freak? Do they yeah. still exist? Uh, n now it's called burlesque, but yeah. <laughs> 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 but yeah. Wow. So there was like, literally it was like a, they had a mutant bind. It was like a gallery of like two-headed cows and all this weird shit. And then there was like on the other side, it was like, come and see the world's shortest comedian. Blah, 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 blah. And um, I would get paid. $75 a show to do 10 minutes. And I would do six shows in a night for the Adelaide Fringe. Wow. And so that's when I've, like, that's how I got my hours up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's so, a lot, yeah, that's a lot of time and it's a lot, it's not easy. Time. Yeah. Oh, no, not at all. Cause mm. they just wanted to see the midget. Yeah. But now this midget has an opinion and they don't know how to do what to do with it. Especially, did you find those, the late shows where they're drunk and there's oh, a yeah. bit like, that that even a bit yeah but i was also quite young and drunk with them because <laughs> after show number six you're like you know yeah i will have a scotch you yeah. know <laughs> yeah yeah now give me that give me that joint like i'm done and so <laughs> the last ever uh, free uh, freak show i did i got so drunk and stoned that it was like 1 30 in the morning it was show number eight <laughs> and i took the stage and there was all these fat like bulbous, you know those red-faced drunken idiots. Yeah, you know? it was like a room full of them, and there. And I just had this thought: I'm like these guys are looking at me like I'm the weird one, <laughs> and I'm getting paid, and they paid to see it, and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And all I could do was laugh. <laughs> I laughed for ten minutes and then left, <laughs> and that was the show. <laughs> hey, that's art, man. I guarantee there was at least one person who, whoa, man. Yeah, yeah. That said so much. Oh, my God, yeah. He's laughing at us. Wow. Yeah. The shoe was on the other foot. He turned it back on us, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, um, that was fun. That, yeah, that's, wow. That's, um, so how, how did, like, 
obviously comedy is one thing to explain to the the family. Yeah. How did your family go when, like, obviously dad's, you've got a bit of show business in exactly, the family. Exactly, yeah. How did the, how did the freak show thing go when you're telling your mum and, and yeah. your sister? Well, the reason why I got the show mm. is because my sister didn't want to do it. Oh, wow. So yeah. is your sister in show business too? Yeah, she's a, she was a, a, a actress, belly dancer and a circus performer. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so she didn't. She was doing this belly dancing act. She didn't want to do it. So she was like, just talk to my brother. He just started doing comedy. And so I got the gig through my sister. Uh, and my mum was just happy that I was getting paid. That's, yeah. And, yeah, like it's not, I'm the one that was like, have higher expectations and like, and I stopped doing those. And I've said no to so many TV sketches because I didn't find it funny. Yeah. And so like, I've, I've definitely protected the, my, you know, un, unique selling point because I wanted to do this a long time mm. and I didn't want to be typecast and like, I've said no to a lot. Well, that's one of the things about your, like uh, your stand up. like there is the, like I said, there's that pop when you first come onto stage. Yeah. People aren't expecting to, to see a three foot four guy yeah. um, doing comedy. But then it's not just like it's not just that. Like yeah. let's acknowledge that and then let's talk let's about talk. Yeah, yeah. what you're what you're doing. I would have been is... a comedian either way. Yeah. Like I genuinely believe that. Like if I was I'm always gonna be a comedian in every every other lifestyle. Mm. I'm just uh yeah. So and it's and I it's I get this one after, a lot after shows. They go, I thought you were going to be shit, but you were actually good. Because they do see that I'm going to be just a novelty act. I love that they can. I, I, I just, that sort of, that's exactly the type of compliment I can hear a comedy audience member saying. Oh, yeah. And it's amazing that the way they, yeah. There's, so, there's never just a straight compliment. No, but my favourite one is when you're sitting in a, you're, all comedians are sitting in a group. Mm. And then they go to one guy, you were great. You were good also. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's like, just just keep walking. Just just keep walking. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed that. Like, you don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't... love when they, um, they also, or people that want to tell you who their favourite was. You're, yeah. You're my favourite. Or they tell you, oh, we didn't really like that guy. It's like, oh. you, you know what? That person might, like, you have no idea. We all work together. We yeah, all know yeah. each other. Go you, tell him. That person's actually one of my friends and I find them really funny. So yeah. <laughs> whenever they say you're my favorite, um, I just go, don't tell me, tell the person that books it. <laughs> yeah. Send an email. Yeah. Like that's it. Let me get booked again because I don't need to know. I'm, I know I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> give me a follow on social media. Or yeah, something. exactly. Give yeah. me something tangible that can, yeah, that can, yeah, that can make a difference. But, but yeah, you're not wrong. That, that That's so funny that they, that, that you get that. I, I didn't think you were going um, to be very good. Um, but we're very lucky in Australia that we don't have those comment cards like a lot of clubs in the UK and America have. Oh, God. Where they do. Write down their comments. Yeah. And then, oh, some people don't get booked after that. Like, it's brutal. That's, yeah, that, I, that is pretty brutal, especially if it's somewhere where you, you've done well, you've done well, and then you have it. Like, because anyone can have a bad night, you're yeah. off or whatever. Yeah. And then, like, man, you're out. That, that's a harsh sort of existence. Yeah. And, like, like uh, the comedy store in London, brutal. If you run 30 seconds over your time, you're not invited back. You're done. Wow. You know? Yeah. Even, you know, it's like it's, they're very harsh mm. because there's so many comedians. I've got to be honest. I wouldn't mind a little more time. Management. Management and some of the gigs that we do. Like, yeah. Because that used to be, because the store used to be a lot more like that. Like now, like they still want you to stick the time, but it's not the yeah. the same thing. When I first started working there, um, and you'd remember those, like those days where they, like the sound person would write down how long everyone did. Oh yeah, they don't do that I anymore? I don't believe so. I don't, I don't know. They, just, they do do reports. Yeah, yeah. But I, I love the old uh, bell. The bell? I love the bell at the um, friend at the in hand. Mike in hand, yeah, that was that. Looking back at net, that now, it seems bizarre. And trying to explain to newer yeah. like, comics that that was a thing. So just for people listening or watching, um, <laughs> the, uh, the the Mike in hand. So they would ring a bell once when you had a minute to go, and then twice when you got the time. Yeah, and then they would 
And then if you had did 30 seconds above your time, they would just keep ringing it until yeah. you got off. And the, the audience knew what it meant yeah, too. Yeah, because they would tell the audience. Yeah, what, yeah. And I like that because then the audience knows what's it, what's up. But I remember going there as as a punter, like before I did my first gig, and it was like kind of, yeah. because if you weren't enjoying someone, you'd hear that ding and you go, ah, oh, this is almost over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you'd actually hear the sigh of relief. Yeah. <laughs> the collective room going, ah. Oh. Well, it was always funny too, because there, like, people would, you know, try some different stuff. And sometimes I remember seeing an act that I liked, but they, they'd they start, they were, I don't know if they were drunk or whatever, but they'd start, and they're doing real well for, like, the first chunk. And then they'd started to go down a road that was just, like, it was obvious they were trying something that wasn't clicking. Yeah. It was just making everyone more uncomfortable. And then the ding, I was like, oh, thank God, they haven't got time to, to finish it <laughs> to up. To go further down this road. Yeah. But that I loved that gig. It was oh mate, that was that was an institution at the time. Yeah, that, that was, was the place to go. It was that and the lounge. Remember the lounge? I remember the. Ca- I used to help run the cafe lounge every now and then when yeah. Reese was out of town. It was the greatest. Is Reese doing anything now? Uh, I'm not sure. Reese, reach out. Let us know what you're up to. Yeah, man, give us a gig. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that that venue shut down was what shut that. Yeah, that was that a beautiful room. venue. Was... I I remember there was a guy who kept. The night I was there, there was a guy that got kicked out for inappropriately touching women whilst walking by the row. Really? He would do, he would like rub his dick against their shoulders. Yeah. And too many people complained. And uh, I think I was hosting, or I was on stage at the time, and I ha- I just made sure he wouldn't come back in. And we kicked them all. And the audience were, they didn't know what happened, and I explained it, and it, it, it almost created a riot. It was right. wild. They uh, Yeah, they were a great audience. It was I remember taking... Um, Dom Herrera when he was out here down there because he had a night off and I think the head we had a headliner who dropped out and so just by chance I sort of I'd worked with him at the store that weekend so I rang yeah. the guys that brought him out here and said do you reckon he's on a night off do you reckon he'd want to come down and do this and then he came down and he just says to me Andrew this is the coolest place I've yeah. ever been and I'm like, you opened for Cher. Like, yeah. <laughs> you've been to some cool places. Like, you've known it. You really? Rodney, yeah. He used to open for Cher on the... Damn. Right. That's like, he had the th- oh. the best stories. I used to love getting his stories. I, yeah, How's this so though? Funny. So I, um, when he was out, I, after that, Steve Philp rang and had a gig in Newcastle. And he said, he said to me, do you reckon he'd do it? Because he knew that I'd sort of hung out with him a bit when he was out here. Like, we'd gig together a lot. And um, I said, yeah, you probably would just run it past the guys, you know. So yeah. they booked, I said, mate, you're going to love it. I said, because he, he, Philby was picking him up, driving him to Newcastle, driving him back. I said, yeah. mate, time in the car with him. Like, you're going to love it. He's got the best stories. Like I said, just, you know, and I was telling him a few of the things he told me, Dom had told me, and I'm like, yeah, mate, you're going to love it. And um, a few days later, Philby rings me. I said, oh, how was it? Did you get the stories? He goes, mate, he got in the car, he fell asleep. <laughs> We got to the venue, he did the gig, yeah. we drove back, he slept the whole way back. Oh, fantastic. Because I didn't get one story out of it. Because <laughs> Philby was like, because yeah, like, um, Dom knew, like, had stories about Rodney yeah, Dangerfield and all oh, that yeah, sort of, like, everyone. crazy good, just interesting stories. And his, his early stuff with the accent. Oh. The, what was it? I don't say such things, like, stroke the penis. And <laughs> I don't say such things, and he just says it all. Like he was, he was, um, yeah, when he was out, he was so fun to work with. Like, just. Sorry. Yeah, he's still just, around. Yeah, yeah thank he's God. He's living in LA. He's, he's doing well. Yeah. He's, so, yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. He's yeah. very funny. Dom, reach out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll get the lounge going again. Come on, oh, Dom. Imagine that. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm going to, because I'm moving to Sydney proper. Yeah. Um, and in December. And I, I think I'm going to start a monthly something. Because, oh really? Yeah, I want I want I want something where, like like a fuck club, but like lighter. Mm. Remember fuck club? I remember fuck club. Like just a a place where you don't have to impress anyone. Get yeah. that Berlin vibe going. How would you describe like to list people listening? How would you describe that? Because it was experimental. Experimental. It was the thing that was beautiful about it was experimental. There was uh, the performers weren't only on stage; they were in the audience. Mm. And it was this, it was like, you had to be there. You know when you tell someone a story and they don't laugh, you're like, oh, yeah. no, you had to be there? It was that kind of vibe where you just had to be there. You can't recreate it in a, a, you can't film it. 
you also had to be, and when you were performing, you had to be there like you in, to, in the moment, present. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. It, it wasn't a place you could just get up and do your stuff. You couldn't, oh, yeah, and I've seen some comedians that were good comics that just couldn't uh, go with the flow mm. and ruin their night, and it was really fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I like, I, you know, I like a little bit of struggle, you know, it's like a workout. Yeah, which is, it, it, look, comedy's hard, it should be hard. Yeah. That's, that's what makes it fun. Exactly. So, and look, that's, that's not to say like every night, you want every night to be like that, but those gigs are fun to do to challenge something else or do like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And give an audience uh, a reason to come to this show specifically, mm. because now it's really hard to run a gig because it, you, what, you're going to, it's like, why would they come to your show when they can just go to the comedy store and they know it's going to be good? Yeah. You know, it's really hard. You know what I mean? So you've yes. got to have a point of difference. Yeah. No, I, 100%. And I think that's, I think that there is a bit of a gap at the moment for that. Um, no one's steal a man's idea. All yeah, right? it's all good. Yeah, yeah. I've been struggling my whole career to find a point of difference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, he's found something about <laughs> him that's a bit different to everyone else. No, it's not even my idea. <laughs> But, but I, I think I think that's a like it's a it's a solid sort of idea that yeah you know, and be good. you know just because I, I want I want it to be fun and loose and punky again far out yes you know? yeah. yeah that's I think I think that's those I think there's something I don't know if it's I don't know about you but do you find you sometimes romanticize back times oh, yeah. when you were doing gigs that didn't but but because they like it was just for the pure. Yeah. You, the gig wasn't going anywhere. You weren't really getting paid anything. But yeah. You just were there because of the, yeah. you needed to exactly. do, do a gig. Yeah. And I think it's where you romanticize it, but I think it's also important to to give that, uh, like when, when you, you're married, right? Mm -hmm. You need to make an effort to make it feel like it was. Put yeah. in the effort to keep the spice alive. Oh, yeah. But you, yeah. You, like, you, you can't take. It's like any, you can't take it for granted. Yeah. Like when, like like a relationship, like in a relationship, if it's just for granted, then, yeah. then that sort then of. Then you lose the passion for yeah. it and you go, oh, actually the thing that I love doing as a hobby has become a job. Yeah. So I want to make it a bit of a hobby again. Which is where, like, it's nothing wrong with it becoming a job because that's sort of the dream. Yeah. But you've got to remember that that what what you were doing that made you want to turn it into exactly. a job. Exactly, exactly. It's not that I wanted this to be a job. It's that I wanted this, I wanted to have the resources that this is the only thing I get to do. Exactly, yeah. And so like, and I also want to be able to have, like there are some comedians now that are so, like up and comers that are quite, you know, job orientated. Mm. And it's like, it'd be really cool to have like younger comedians play for a bit. That is, that is something I think that's changed even just in the time we've been doing it is, is it is much more, there is much more of a clear, I don't know, maybe, maybe, yeah, clear path. Maybe, maybe that's, I don't know, my perspective because yeah. I've seen it, but it's, it does seem to be like a much more like people come in with, oh no, this is my plan from the start. Yeah, exactly. Rather than, oh, I'll, I'll just see if I can do this and then get better and then. Yeah, get the five, get the 10. It's yeah. like, no, no. First, I'm going to get 10,000 followers and then I'm going to do five. <laughs> you know, it's all that. And so when, whatever show I make, I'm going to make sure there's no phones in the room. Oh. Like that is, that is, there's no uh, negotiation on that. Take the phone away so people are in the moment. But, and that's the other thing too, is I think like, like you know, because there's one thing, lock, lock phones up so no one can film or whatever. Yeah. To me is less of a worry than... I don't want them to have their phone. Like the thing that appeals to me about that is then then they've got nothing else to focus on. There's no distraction. Yeah, exactly. They don't and and if they have a pang of anxiety, because I've done it before, you have a pang and you reach for your phone. Mm. If you're having a pang of anxiety at a show and you don't have a phone to reach with, you've got to confront what's going on. That, it, it amazes me how powerful that is with your phone. Like I don't know about yeah. you, but I'll often be sitting watching like you know a show. Of, want to watch on TV and all of a sudden without thinking I've got my phone in my hand and I'm like I'm like what what am I doing like, yeah I was this is... I went to send in I went to check on a gig that I was doing yesterday yep to see what my times were and I opened Instagram up because that's where the chat was and I just started scrolling for an hour I'm like what what was I do? and I like you just lose your time yeah it's yeah brutal. I don't think it's good for our brains to be no. honest but I think uh everyone's getting ADD because of it 
Do That's you? my little hot take. Yeah, there might be something. I mean, there. I haven't been to high school or, pro, or yeah. law, uh, any university. Well, this is the but I do we're, allowed to, we're allowed to throw medical theories yeah. out there. I listen to Joe Rogan sometimes. So that... <laughs> 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 so I think that qualifies. Well, you got your Bachelor of Rogan. So. Yeah, I actually I want to message because Rogan, you got obsessed with these um, pygmy tribes that died out. Oh yeah, the little hairy uh, Indonesian. They yep. called them the hobbits. They found, uh, and he's like, it wouldn't it be wild if they lived today? Uh, Rogan, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, I'm a I'm a real life hobbit. Put me on the old fucking podcast. Oh yeah, that'd be that'd be one. There'd be some numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, then I, maybe I can, you know, sell a show. <laughs> oh, fuck. I don't know, man. Right. So, okay, so obviously you enjoy the the acting's going well, the, the comedy's going well, you're yeah. enjoying it. We are getting close to time, so yeah. at the end I'll get you to plug whatever you want to plug, including yeah. your theoretical monthly room that's coming at the end yeah. of the year. But um, say five years' time from now, if everything's sort of just fallen the way... Yeah, you want it like Rogan calls. He says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aman, this is this is a go." What what is what is your like? What does your your scene look like? What are you, what are you doing? How like ah uh, like for me, it's very simple. Like my uh, whatever I think success would look like for me is if I could sell, uh, if I could do three solo shows or two solo shows a week uh, in different cities. Um. That is it. Just that's touring. all. I, that's all. I, I just want to be able to do my hour. Yeah. Uh, for you know, twice a week. That's that is all I really want. Um, uh, you know, and maybe write a, a, a it's like a rom com action movie. I've got. <laughs> I think I've. I there's a. I've got some sketch minds, like sketch ideas for this film, and you know, it's just some silly shit. Yeah, nice. Um, and I would like to be a a travel documentary. Like, I'd watch that. Yeah. You've got an interesting take on things and an yeah. interesting you you ask different questions to most people, eh? Yeah. So I went so. yeah, I wanted to do the um I'm I'm working together on this pitch about like travelling the old Phoenician Empire. Oh wow. So like the coast of the Mediterranean all the yep. way all across and just see who makes the best chicken sandwich or whatever, you know, like <laughs> Like, finally settle it. Yeah, finally, yeah. Finally, finally, the Middle East and the Mediterranean yeah. will be sorted because then, we know. Yeah, and that's that's we that's where the peace will come. Yeah, right. yeah. Perfect. I think, yeah, that's my. What? <laughs> watch out, Tel Aviv! I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before we go, because we are at time. Um, yeah. Where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they find out about everything you're doing? Um, uh, Instagram mostly. Uh, Iman Frank Hachidi. Uh, or just write the world's shortest comedian. You'll probably find it. Um, uh, I'm usually I, I'm darting all over the place, but I usually put my dates on that. Uh, you can get me on eman.standup at gmail dot com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you really want to find me, I might be at the foot of your auntie's bed. <laughs> That's a thought that's going to fester. <laughs> Mate, thanks so much for doing thanks, this. Thanks, man. That was really Jeez. fun.